so today's meetup is about, um, is titled, Is Government Really Necessary? Uh, I did put up some uh, links to some uh, essays uh, to hopefully sort of prime the discussion, but also to clear out some uh, misconceptions about what anarchism is. There we go. A for anarchism. Oops. <laughs> Anyways, um, the first thing is this. Uh, if we're going to consider is government really necessary, I think one of the first uh, things we need to look at is what is government uh, in terms of its historically, but also what it is in the present. And there, there we can go into what government is likely to be in the future. Uh, what I've seen of some discussions like this is it sometimes turns into a discussion of what kind of government uh, would the advocate of government like to have. I would say if we're going to talk about is government necessary, we need to look at what, right, we need to look at government in all of its actual manifestations. What has it been historically and uh, what is it today? And, and then when you look at it that way, basically if somebody's going to defend the government, they're defending government as an institution. And we need to look at it uh, there. So anyways, as a libertarian anarchist, I came to the conclusion that no, we do not need a coercive government. Government defined as a monopoly on the use of force within a certain geographical area. That there are better ways to prove to provide for things like law and security without forcing people to pay for it, without saying you live within our jurisdiction, so you must submit to us and things like that. There are historical examples of the non-government provision of law. Uh, the first one that comes to mind is uh, Lex Mercatoria, Merchant Law of the Middle Ages. This was basically a privately um, administered system of law. We, in the U.S. today, and uh, going back into the recent past, we have arbitration of different kinds that work outside of the court system. I think the major problem I would see with government is that it is uh, based on it is based on coercion, uh, and that is coercion of people who have not aggressed against anybody. Um, and I'm going to start sounding like a broken record for those of you who come to these meetups and listen to me talk. We start from the, I always start from the premise that the non-aggression principle is what guides us. It's the basis of all our human relationships. That it is immoral to initiate the use of force against peaceful people. And any time that you do initiate the use of force against peaceful people, you are violating their rights and you are breaking, uh, you're committing an immoral act. And from there you derive the right of self-defense. If it's immoral to aggress, it's, you know, the, it seems obvious you have a right to defend yourself. And that's the basis of law, is self-defense. When you band together, in other words, when the group of people act collectively for their self-defense, they do it through a system of law. Now, one thing that governments do that I have that I have a problem with is they the collective will often decide that the the collective can do things that the individual can't, namely the aggression. Uh, for example, to refer back to the debate about gun control, uh, the collective, the, the individual cannot say, uh, you have a gun, I'm going to take it from you. As an individual, I cannot do that. You would say, whoa, who the hell are you? What are you doing? But then, as a collective, people will sometimes say, well, we're going to pass gun control laws, and therefore we're going to take everybody's guns away. Like, what you can't do as an individual, you cannot do as a collective. And I think that's one of the major areas where governments start to fall down, is they start aggressing against people. Um, to get a little more controversial, taxation is an issue on, the, on that account. I, as an individual, I can't say, you know, give me your money. That would be robbery. But then as a collective, they say, well, you guys are going to start paying taxes, and if you don't pay them, we're going to send thugs to lock you up, and that's not considered theft. Well, in my book, it is theft. You force people to part with their money, you're stealing their money. Well, that's my say about government. Uh, I don't know if I should throw open the floor at this point to uh, what others might have to say. I guess, Frank, you're raising your hand. Yeah, well, I, my, my understanding of this was we were going to have kind of a debate on this kind of thing. So. Oh, no, these are just discussions. Right. Well, let me.
me let me point out number one, that point of view is profoundly asocial. It's asocial. It's apolitical. It has no correspondence with the way this norm, the way real human societies have developed. First of all, a system of property rights, uh, of which undergirds any kind of market economy, any kind of economy based on freely given contractual consent on the alienation of goods and services, presupposes a set of social rules, a set of coercive social rules that are not atomistically located in the individual. They're called property rights. They're enforced by institutions. They don't have to be centralized in their interest, such as government. They could be central, they could be enforced on a decentralized basis. A living example of which is the international government. Based on a sovereign state system, there is no world government. There's approximately 200 sovereign property owners that carve up the planet. And to greater or to lesser degrees, they cooperate on, for the purposes of enforcing that particular property rights system. Conventionally, property rights are enforced centrally because the conditions under which groups can enforce them voluntarily without a free rider problem become astronomically problematic as the size of the group increases. A society of 200 nation states is one thing. A society of millions is something else. Uh, and it's not just a question of the numbers making the free rider problem difficult to overcome. There's the question of principal agent. In other words, the need to delegate, to monitor, the compliance of others in any kind of rule-based system. Uh, we have to sleep. So the odds of you being able to monitor your property on your own and monitor the cooperation of others on your own to ensure that they are not acting as free riders diminishes rapidly as the size of the group increases. The common solution to these size issues is centralized institutions, meaning government. Uh, there's no getting around the need for rule enforcement. Um, you mentioned things like, I point a gun at you and I threaten to take your money. The notion of your is problematic. Mine is problematic. Because these are not ahistorical natural rights concepts. We might have a moral position that elevates the person to the level of moral significance. And that's essentially what I, where I think you're heading. It's a kind of natural right, rights conception of, of the individual. But that's simply a normative argument. It's not based on the appearance of the matter. The empirics of the matter are pretty straightforward. People aggress against each other if they can. Because the empirics of the matter are that people are self-interested. And what constrains self-interested people are rules. And if rules are designed in a way that permit aggression, aggression takes place. Slavery is a great example. Okay, in a slavery system, there are private property rights. They're not distributed equally. There's a subset of the population, large or small, that it is disallowed access to the fruits of their own labor by law. Enforced by the state. Uh, other systems of oppression, you know, we can think of them, but they abound, obviously. I'm not going to go through the list of them right now. Uh, the image that is evoked here by this anarchism of you know, a society of people who are voluntarily contracting with each other, cooperating in a division of labor, surrendering the fruits of their labor in a public market, citizens informed, uh, protecting themselves. It evokes the image of young farmer, small craftsman. Uh, it evokes 19th, 18th century America. It's a nice and pretty image, but I remind you all that that image and that society, to the degree that it existed, was itself the creation of coercion. Okay? It was made possible by state enforcement in the form of British imperialism. It was expanded across the North American continent by eliminating the free aboriginal or the, the aboriginal people that lived here at one point in time, and in so doing, replaced one set of rules, rules that governed this continent before white settlers from Europe got here, to another set of rules. Okay? And in so doing, a reallocation of resources took place. And takes place. 
So, first of all, so my, basically, you can boil my argument down to this. Number one, any system of voluntary contract is itself a version of a coercive system of rule. And I don't say this pejoratively. There's no escape coercive systems of rule. Just get to choose which one you're going with. Unless you're planning on being a Robinson Crusoe, truly. Okay, otherwise, coercion is the order of the day. You only get to choose which one. Number two, the particular, this, this notion that the coercive system of rule called property rights and markets can function and scale and reproduce on its own, voluntarily, without centralized government, is mostly an empirical mythology when you start scaling it to large numbers. And my third point, which I didn't really elaborate on, and I think we can maybe as the discussion progresses, the argument seems to um, privilege a particular set of values that authorizes what is good to be that which one can capture by, one's, by, by the fruit of one's labor. That one's worth in a society, one's moral worth, comes from their ability to capture everything that's due to them by virtue of their own work. That's great, except where do kids fit into it? Where do the elderly fit into it? Where they, do the handicapped fit into it? Where do the involuntarily unemployed fit into it? Okay, we have solutions to all of those things in real societies. Those solutions do not involve markets. If I put a baby in a marketplace, and said, you get it, what you get based on your legal entitlement to go work, you're dead. And not only is the baby dead, but the society that imposes that rule on all the babies dies. It doesn't reproduce. So let's circle it back to the group so everybody has a chance to participate. I don't want to hog the, uh, the time either. Does uh, somebody want to, somebody want to uh, counter some of that? Or? Could you speak up? Now I'm working for tax start. Sorry, like it has now I'm working for taxation. <laughs> someone uh, putting a gun and saying, uh, give me your property. You said that property is someone buying yours is arbitrary. It's not arbitrary, arbitrary, but it's historically related. If I pointed a gun at a slave and said, give me your money, the slave could write like say, say, I have, I don't, the money that's on my purse right now is not mine. Because a slave doesn't own anything. The, the whole notion of pointing a gun at someone and saying your money or your life is contextually and historically specific to a system of rules. In this case, it presupposes that you have a property right to the money in your pocket, okay. and I have a property right to my gun. Frank, Frank, let me, let me let others talk, please. <laughs> Do you have a property right to the fruits of your labor as you said? Only under certain rules. The rules of a market economy. Not a slave economy. If you were a slave, you would not. Any market economy. But that's the point. That's the point, though, isn't it? A slave society that's enforced by government. Well, most property right rules are enforced by governments. Contractual property rights. Not coercive property rights. What's the difference? I think I've just established Because if you and I are engaged in a voluntary exchange, if I don't deliver the goods that I promised you after you pay me some goods that you promised me, then we have a breach of contract and you can either sue me or the other side of the coin is that, you know, we trade equally, we both get more. Yeah, but where do you get your property right from? I got it from my labor. I got you don't. You get it from a set of rules. Well, there's the set of rules. Yeah, what would you do if there wasn't a set of rules? There's a set of rules. Uh, then, you'd have, then you'd have widespread theft and social degeneration. Then one of the two you need rules. Rules. whose property right was more. That's why you need rules. More so, 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 so in other words, without you have to we'd all just be robbing each other. No, without rules, yes, you would. That's why we have international war. Let's hear, I want to hear what you have. Sorry, what I'm saying is that without rules, at the end of the day, there's nothing to enforce who's actually correct in the contract. If you want to say there is such thing as correction, both of you would believe that you're right, which means it comes down to, if you want to boil it down all the way to the bottom, it would be who can overpower the other one with who is more right. Right. So that doesn't mean that the person who is contractually right is right. That means the person who can actually use more force is right, which is why we kind of need a government to enforce those contracts to actually say this is what's right 
this is what's wrong. Otherwise, it's not necessarily we'd have widespread panic, but we'd have more of chaos between the people because there would be you could general disagreement to with between minute. what is right and centralized, which is, I think, Darren's, part of Darren's argument. Uh, yes. Here, I wanted to I wanted to jump in a little bit because I'm hearing some things. Let me get this back to myself. I'm hearing some things that are 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 a little bit strange um, because they're not actually what anarchists are advocating. Uh, talking about overpowering people, uh, you're describing government. You're not describing anarchism uh, at all. This is what governments do. They overpower people. We, Why? We've seen because they have power. Exactly that. So if I I, mean, if you had power, you would overpower too. No, I would not. But I, well, my point is not to give makes people... Government, makes government my first point first. is to not to give people that kind of power. That's the whole problem. What? When you describe like overpowering people, you talk about slavery. That is not property rights. That is the denial of property rights. Your first property is your own self. I think one thing that needs to be very clear, anarchism is not about the uh, absence of governance. It is about not having coercive government that can force you to participate. Where if you wanted to have uh, your own, uh, if you want to make your own security arrangements through a company, an insurance company, something like that, then that's what we're saying. Nobody can force you to go with company A as opposed to company yeah, B. Well, why did southern slave owners violently resist the end of slavery if it wasn't because they didn't want to see their property rights taken from them? That's a misconception of what property rights are. You have no right to another human being. There is no they property right. right there. That they is the deal. Right. There is not a moral right here. But that's not what history is about. History is about governments that have been oppressive, that have pro prevented human progress for millennia. But you have to Until ground your normative principles in something real. Yes, I am. I think that the reality of government, which is so destructive, 200 million people killed in the 20th century. That's nothing good to say about government. Uh, it's been as we've gotten you know, out from under government, is, you know, over time, we've seen progress. That's the reality here. Where is that? Yeah. Where? Uh, well, look at history. I was going to say, look at history. From the Magna Carta on. I mean, you've got We've a, seen a decrease in liberty, a decrease in government rule. Until and recently. You've had a growth in people getting out of poverty. You've had a growth in liberty. You've had a deep growth in people making their yep. own decisions. Well, those were governments that fostered that, and those same governments can engage in the same kind of international conduct of war that you were just complaining about. Well, those they, I think they declared their own rights. The, the those were the same went, people that signed the Magna Carta. Right. The church, well, you could say that the church is its own kind of government, but they went to the king and said, like, no more. You just can't come and usurp property. You can't come and tell our people to fight any wars that you see fit to fight. Right. Right. It, it was, it was, was, system it was a way of decentralization. Yeah. Now, I'm not saying, like, first of all, let me establish something. I'm not an anarchist. I am a minimal government advocate. First of all, I think that probably we can all agree that government is way too big, whether you think that it's overstepping its bounds internationally, overstepping its bounds as far as uh, corporate welfare, that sort of thing. I happen to think it's just all over the place. But Anarchy is not even, I don't think we even what we're talking about here right now because we're so far away from anarchy that we can't even, first of all, we have to get down government, to me, down to its constitutional role. And then we can start talking about anarchy. I mean, you mentioned that you can't imagine like a, any other enforcement of property rights than a court system. Well, that's because there isn't any discussion about that. I mean, maybe there isn't, maybe there is, but the fact is that we're not allowed that discussion because government has a monopoly over that field of force, of law enforcement, of contractual property rights. We don't know, but if we get down to a minimal government where people are more free to exchange ideas, there are people who are much smarter than any of us who could probably come up with a way that we can have better law enforcement, we can have better contractual enforcement. No, we just don't know because we've got this monopoly given to us at the point of a gun. So how can we ever find out? But first of all, I think we just have to talk about what is government necessary and what is government necessary for and what is it not necessary for? What can we get it out of right now? I mean, do we need to protect Germany and France 
and Japan right now? Can we bring those troops home? Even if you don't, even if you agree with the war in the Middle East, can we get the other troops home? Okay. Uh, Let me that's stop a voluntary there. agreement between two property owners, Germany and the United States. Well, I'm going to, I want to uh, stop you right there. Wait, I'm going to stop Frank. I want to stop you, Frank. Frank, let me stop you there. Uh, countries do not own property; individuals do. You're wrong. I am you're completely right. Wrong. Well, I, uh, legally, not morally. I don't care about the legal well, thing. You morally. Don't this as if it's morally. A, a, an empirical argument. It is. About the world. No. It is an imperial argument. No. no. It's the governments that try to claim property rights that are de defined as right. destroying, destroying selling property rights. What? That's the real world. I know what the real world is. And I'm saying to you is that governments well, destroy then, property then rights. You ask yourself, if that is the real world, then the question becomes, yes. if government is not necessary, then why has government historically been the solution to the collective rights problem? It has not. It's been the destroyer of rights, not the you're solution. Not asking, you're not answering the question. Frank's saying is that without government, there are no rights, because government establishes those rights. And right. As no, morality fact, establishes rights, and like the Declaration of Independence says, in the ideal, the governments are to secure these rights. Yes, I understand that. That's ideology. Okay. That's not what happened. In, that's not. But what happens history. in the real world is that governments trample rights all the time. That's true. Yes. But that that still doesn't answer rights. my question. They kind of try to explain rights in the same, same vein that you were talking about before, that we don't understand what else the government can do because we're used to the monopoly they give us. But the same rate, they are led by people who are just like us. They're not necessarily the most smart people. They're not necessarily the most intelligent people to know how to bring it and hire community of people forward. But at the same rate, they're trying to figure out what can bring us forward, which is why they trample on rights while trying, while thinking and that they're giving bring, more rights. You bring, I think you raise an important issue because the whole point behind the Constitution, as I understand it, is the founders understood the Lockean, Hobbesian, Smithian notion of human nature. Self-interested agents acting in the to get what they want and you constrain or you, you generate different social outcomes depending on the rules. Constitution, our Constitution, was designed to be a set of rules that would constrain self-interested actors from doing what's in their you know, best interest in a fashion that harms the rights of others. That's what it's about. Okay, let me, let me, let's not, let's have others to speak. Yeah, you have spoken. Yes. I think it's, you, 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 um, you point to um, property ownership as, um, you mentioned that as if it's like some divine fundamental right. There have been a lot of societies, small collective societies, in which there was no property ownership at all, individual property ownership. And I think it's debatable whether that's a, a fundamental right at all. I, I, you know, there are a lot of societies that didn't recognize individual property ownership at all. Well, I would Which also see that. Yeah, and that's a historical fact. Yeah. That gets well, back to the question of the history. But what, Can how far do you name one, please? Yes, go ahead. Mongolia. I just, what? Mongolia. Mongolia, nobody owned property. No. Hmm. Property was held in the collective. Some Native it's American collective. society. It's collective. So you know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's why we have to get away from this notion that, that property rights yeah. equal private yeah. property rights. That, that's a mistake. I mean, they're part of what used to be the Soviet Union, but there were no, it wasn't like a little, uh, you know, like your plot is four acres here. You know, the whole group of them had a, a huge space where they could just Longer, you know, that was by covenantal agreement, or Pardon? by was that by enforcement or covenantal agreement? No, they just did their thing. Yeah, but it was like that, that, that was the oh, collective that. agreement of the of the really society. Well, look at that yeah. so, yeah. so, so, how, how, how did the collective society of the Native Americans work? I'm not. Well, I think there were a lot of different Native American societies over a huge area. There is no one Native American that, that, society. They didn't all that's recognize true. the concept of individuals owning property. That's yeah. kind of, that's what, I'm no yeah. expert on Native American societies, that's right. yeah. but that's what I was thinking of when I said that. Yeah, well, that's a good example. It, really, what, what, we, what I think we're all saying here, as a matter of fact, the, the, the massive commoditization of resources, which is the all-pervasive part of society, is a historical entity. It is not a trans-historical concept. 
It's largely situated to post-1500 Europe and all of the societies that subsequently were colonized by it. And ha but haven't we seen as governments have uh, receded in their power, we've seen then the progress that we, we get to enjoy today. You're I think that's, argument that's an important point. That's, that's and, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, let me, let, me, let me finish. I think we've seen that. We've also seen in like parts of the American West that were outside of the control of government, even if they were within U.S. borders, where people developed syst private systems of law that that they actually preferred over the ones that were imposed on them later. And this, this you know, worked much better. What I'm trying to say is there's, there's the history, again, of the evil that government does. If you're going to say, okay, I'm not an anarchist, I'm saying offering up government as a solution is actually not offering a viable solution. There's too many people killed, too many wars fought, too many rights trampled to really offer that up as a viable solution. Yes. Okay. Um, one thing I'd like to say is you're talking about without, you know, well, in the world of anarchy, without the government, that people would be using their moral, you know, their natural moral existence, and that's how everybody would get along. Well, well, I don't think people, I don't believe in the goodness of people. <laughs> I mean, see, I think if that had happened in our government, that, for example, I think women would still be barefoot and pregnant. Okay. With 18 uh, children. Okay, you wanted to say anything? Could you, could you raise your hand for a minute? All right. Um, well, the fact is, I mean, people have acted to help each other out of the goodness of their hearts. I mean, if you read Alexis de Tocqueville, uh, who came over here in the mid-1800s. Uh, I mean, he came over here to study our penal system and decided to stick around and see what other aspects of American society he could, he could observe. And um, throughout his, his book, he mentions the fact that people are very distrustful of government, and when some of them, if somebody needs something, they form associations, they form mutual aid societies. Uh, you know, a quote I keep going back to is Bill Clinton when he, when they did welfare reform, he said the era of big government is over, but that doesn't mean we should go back to the days of every man for himself. Well, those days never existed because human society has always existed in the cooperative. We've always progressed in the cooperative by voluntary exchange or coercive exchange, I guess, if you want to, if you want to be uh, historically correct. But I mean, when people need things, it's not, I mean, we're, we just don't. We're acting beings. We don't just sit there and wait for our, for our predicament to get worse and suddenly die. I mean, we look to other people. We ask for people. We, we offer things to get what we need. And people give us things for stuff that they need. I mean, it's, it's always been a cooperative. Again, this doesn't scale. There, there's a, there, there is no accident that the size of the American state grew exponentially starting in the late 19th century and going into the 20th. It had to do with the decline of the small yeoman society that made voluntary associations more feasible and made the problems associated with market, market failures such as depressions, recessions, uh, labor conflicts, uh, misrepresentation of contract resulting in crappy water, crappy food, unsafe working conditions. All of that stuff in theory can be resolved through contractual voluntary relationships among individuals, but it doesn't scale to large societies. And so in large societies, which is what the United States became, uh, those individuals who could not spend for themselves in what effectively became a dog and dog market used the collective power of the state to redress market failure. Okay, let me and let me tell you right now, you never would have had a solution to the depression short of many, many more years okay, of let me, deprivation let me, without state. Let's let's give it to this gentleman here. Yeah, I don't uh, I guess I'll just give two examples of things that I think support the idea of government and the world. So one I something in my eyes that points toward government being a cause of more distress than, you know, um, organization, is if you look around the world and you look at the poverty, the violence, you know,
there are most negative things that you can say about the human population. Uh, the most common denominator, uh, I think, you know, pretty much, und you know, it's undebatable that it's colonialism. It's what? Colonialism. Okay. So when you look at, you know, most of the problems that the world faces today, it does have to do with, um, you know, this idea of uh, people who are on the right side of a law that was set by government, or a way of organizing people that wasn't always suited in the best interest, you know, had more of a negative impact than the absence of what we would say of the government or law. But then, on the other side of that, we have cases like Rwanda. Who? Rwanda. Uh, Rwanda. Where uh, the colonial gov government was uh, there, and people felt oppressed, and they overthrew the government, but then, once that government was overthrown from the chaos, a massacre happened. So, that on the side of anarchy, that doesn't speak positively to the idea of anarchy. But that presupposes that that was anarchy. Yeah, I was going to say, that's not what we're I mean, that's pretty much that's just one gang being overthrown by another gang, and that gang suddenly right, using the same... But it was in the absence the government just... Well, that, you know, that gang right. became the government. So, so you know, that's, 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 that's the thing. That depends on your definition of government, because the only thing that defined them as a government was that they had machetes. Right, and that's, I mean, that's all that defines Because they were, they were is that they have a, an yeah, army. Yeah. I'd, say, okay. I'd say that for uh, what you were saying before, they said the biggest common denominator is colonialism. The biggest common denominator is, is people and humans. And I think that that's the big issue with government, that we look at it from a humanistic, with, we leave out the humanistic aspect in government and the fact that we are imperfect and that we understand things on a linear level. Kind of, we, we were talking about morality before. But we've assumed that everybody here views morality on the same level, in the same kind of plane, when it's completely and totally predicated by experience, which is the whole reason why we need government, because the government can bring us together under a collective idea and bring us forward in progress in some sort of way while trying to protect the rights of the people who don't completely understand the same morality. Well, I'm going to say something now. <laughs> Let me say something now. Um, yeah, that's awesome. I want to go back to, uh, to, to, to Frank. Uh, you mentioned uh, the late 19th century uh, United States. I thought that was very interesting because uh, as I see that, uh, that's the beginning of the progressive era, the beginning of the American empire where they openly advocated imitating the European powers. This was the beginning of destruction, the United States becoming destructive on a scale not seen before. I don't see this as an argument in favor of government, but actually for one very much against it. And wait a minute, um, you mentioned the Depression, which is actually one of my favorite subjects. Um, this was caused by government intervention in the economy, starting with the Federal Reserve. Uh, putting mythology aside, the Hoover administration was extremely interventionist in its approach to the economy. Again, the mythology is of him as Mr. Laissez-faire, where he was actually not. Uh, the, uh, the, Frank, the Roosevelt administration was open about building on the things that Hoover had done before. It was government intervention that prolonged and caused and then prolonged the depression. There's no history there of government stepping up and solving things. There's the history of government stepping up and favoring special interests, organizing robbery, and not protecting rights, but trampling them. Okay, well, first of all, the depression wasn't caused by Federal Reserve and monetary policy. It was caused by a financial collapse on Wall Street that had ripple effects on banks, that had ripple effects on the economy that produced a massive aggregate demand crisis, much like we see today, except for the fact that we have a lot of state intervention today to mitigate against it. Now, to the more fundamental point, which I may have lost at this point, you said something. What you say at the beginning of your, your you started with... Oh, about the American oh, Empire oh, in the oh, Progressive Era, era. yes. Okay. I think we're all starting to conflate notions of the state in a way that is unhealthy. Let me start by saying this. Most states, most times in history, have been predatory entities. Instrumentalities for exploitation, death, and destruction. Mm -hmm. And they are like that, not by nature. They are like that as a function of the social relations and rules within which those states are embedded. So, for example, the Roman Empire, 
was an instrumentality through which slavery and imperialism was allowed to benefit a small subset of Roman society. The American South, pre-Civil War, effectively the same type of system. Um, colonialism, imperialism, are systems of that kind that enslave other peoples for purposes of benefiting a small economic elite somewhere on the planet. If we want to have an argument about, as a practical matter, which set of property relations has produced the most amount of liberty, the most amount of welfare, and the most amount of economic growth in known history, the market is going to win. But that's not what this discussion is about. This discussion is about some theoretical notion, almost like back in the days when I was a Marxist, for me here to try to give you a lecture on why we should move to socialism. And it's, a, it's based on some theoretical thought experiment that has no grounding in the complexities of real human beings living in real, com real societies. Because the question here is, do we need a government in order to manage complex market interactions on a scale of millions? Okay, well, and that's, the that's, answer that's... is no. We can't do it without an essential institution. Okay, um, anybody want to? I think we need to get back to what you were trying to bring up long ago about is government necessary? Yes. And kind of, uh, I feel like where Frank was going is what government really needs to do, as I was saying before about, you know, what we, our own morality is predicated by our experience, and so is our understanding of the world. When you look at uh, famous psychologist Jean Piaget, he believes uh, rationality grows over time. It's slowly, you learn to reason based on the world around you. You have to learn slowly, but most people cannot teach their children how to think rationally and how to think critically, which is why the one thing I believe we really need government for is to teach us to think rationally and critically so that one day we won't need government because we'll all be able to actually teach each other to think rationally and critically. Anybody? Uh, I mean, you can. Can you just have a government with uh, with a court system that, that everyone consents to, that everyone agrees to, and still and that's still a minimalist government that of course they can enforce contracts without uh, having to resort to court or infringing on rights. Did you say Yeah, well, that that's that was the founder's vision. In fact, I think that's what John. I think that's essentially the position John is arguing. It's the position that most minimalist government types would argue. And I think we could have a legitimate discussion about the proper boundaries between the public and the private. But an, but an extremist argument that says there is no need for the public is just, a, I think, has cannot be defended theoretically and certainly cannot, it doesn't have any empirical ground. <coughs> okay, well, okay, go ahead. Uh, I think you, you hit on something earlier that really resonated with me, and that was that the kind of point where government stops becoming, you know, uh, a means to keep people together and turns into a means of exploiting people has to do with representation. If, you know, the, the, the power of the government is so disconnected from the people that it's trying to serve. So, like, I, I think of examples in, let's say, Philadelphia. So there are some communities in Philadelphia that, uh, you know, out of their frustration with the government, you know, kind of form their own governing body that has its own rules that often conflict with the law. But their reason for doing that oftentimes is because the law, you know, they feel marginalized because most people who impose the law uh, don't reflect their, you know, they don't represent them. Yes. So I think it's interesting that the, the argument doesn't have to be about government because I think no matter what, there's, you know, if you define it, I'm glad you made a distinction between what, how government is defined because the community of people are always going to have a set of rules that they abide by exactly. if they're going to live together. Yes. But like you said, size has a lot to do with it. <coughs> representation. All right, well, let me, let me address some of that then, I guess. Um, I think some of this is um, misstating what uh, anarchists are actually advocating. Um, and again, I think there's a little bit of a confusing here of governance 
governance and government. Uh, nobody is advocating against there being a public sphere. What we're saying is that it needs to be voluntarily joined. And what we see historically is that as soon as there is coercion, every, the whole thing becomes destructive. You, yeah, we, we, I can point to a million governments. I mean, if you're going to defend government as an institution, you have to consider that you're defending the institution. There was not Nazi Germany or the USSR. Uh, I mean, the South African government that imposed apartheid. Wait, no, don't interrupt. Slow down, slow down. Okay, let's let everybody finish their statements so we yeah. can clearly understand each other. I would go. I would. I would say. Okay. The question was, how do you organize 300 million people? I would go back to the concept of spontaneous order. Order comes up from the bottom. It is not imposed down from the top. That. Sure, I could. I talked to you before about the Lex Mercatoria of the Middle Ages. I could point to medieval Iceland, the American West outside of the U.S. government controlled way. Uh, medieval Iceland, I could talk to the, um, I think it was called the Brehan of uh, Ireland, which was a, basically a private system of law. I could say that if the order, again, comes from the bottom up, and then institutions are created to protect that order. Order is not imposed from the top down. Where, Alex? Anywhere. Where? Anywhere. Pick a place. Well, what you were saying before, that everywhere. Each community that's living together, no matter what, is going to have their own opinion. That's kind of the what I feel like is the purpose of the American government in the first place, to have localized governments in a completely idealistic society. The way that it should work is that you elect, that we don't understand what we want well enough to bring it to the government, but we elect somebody who can bring that to the government. And then the government at the top is supposed to find the balance of the localized ideas to figure out how to move the entire people forward. Because not every community is going to have the same thing for each other. What? Do you feel that it succeeded in that? No, it's idealistic and ridiculous, but... Yeah, in the real world, you don't have individual atoms running around and then spontaneously one day generating a society in the state. What happens is, is that organized clans clash on some scale of territoriality at some point in history. Somebody wins and imposes a set of rules on everybody else, and then politics ensues. This is the real world. And if we're going to talk about an alternative construction of a society that is workable, that is reproducible, it has to be grounded in the real behavior, historically grounded. That's why the Soviet Union failed. It failed because it was this nirvana image that had no correspondence to how real societies function. And this is going to, this would, this will be confined to the same dust bin of history for the same reason. It failed because they couldn't adapt to anything new. They had one singular idea, and they wouldn't accept another idea that didn't align with their own state. You know, if somebody had something against the government, even if it was helpful for what they were trying to do, like uh, there were the famous iron mines in, I believe, in, somewhere in Siberia, where this one one Russian thinker said, you can't build there. He told them all the different health issues they were going to have, all the problems of the geography, but they didn't care to listen because they thought that no matter what, we were going to have this much more iron. The problem was that they weren't willing to adapt, which is the genius of the American government in the first place. As terrible as it is to say, the American government was really, really smartly founded and meant to grow over time. They realized that for a government to work, it has to be able to change and grow. It's just, well, in we got the way. Wait, 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 wait a minute. Sorry. I just want to think about um, the notion of bottom up versus top down. It's not that simple. I mean, there are, for example, I don't think it's automatically true that bottom up is better than top down. I mean, for example, uh, civil rights were enforced in the South in the 60s from the top down. Bottom up, that wouldn't have happened. There were a lot of racist communities where the civil rights laws were enforced from the top down. Um, also, communities that would say, I don't want evolution taught in our schools. From the top down, they were told, you have to include that in your curriculum. That's science. So it's, it's bottom up is not always better. Well, I would, I would counter that with, with something else, which is that uh, preceding the civil rights being enforced, it was the government that was enforcing segregation. They even was in, he was imposing eugenics. I mean, it was horrible. It was horrible. And yes, that's a good point. The civil rights movement started privately. But yeah, that's true. But if there were not for eventual 
You're right about that, but I mean, it's still ten years. Has still, but that's why we but need they to did, balance. But, but the, 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 there were large portions of the country that wanted no part of it and would have still had no part of it if it weren't let's later imposed top down. Let's go to a real world society based on no government, and it's the world. Okay, the planet is not governed centrally. It's the UN. The UN. Uh, Please. The well, UN right. truly is a voluntary association. Okay. Well, I'm going so, so, to so, stop so, you so, right so. there. Frank, Frank, you're getting outside of the, the scope no, of the discussion right, because right. The, U, the, the world is not it's composed of uh, uh, national citizens. That doesn't work. Yeah, it's they're composed people. of national societies. They're they're composed composed no. Well, it's, it's not. Really it's really how governments relate to each other is not the same as how individuals will relate to each other. That's a separate discussion. I think you're going you're going off into some theoretical I, idea now that like you're confusing me. I don't see it. Uh, there's no such thing as a, a an anarchistic world of national what citizens. Would you call the global planet? I'm sorry. What, what would you call the, the political organization of the planet? Statist. So where's the state? I see many states. Yeah, statist. The many states. Yes. Okay, okay, but who rules the many states? No one. Right, but the states, states are not people, they're not the individuals. states cooperate amongst each other. To they oppress are a collective people. mafia for imposing a mafia. system of rule on the planet. Yes, okay. Okay, just like, a, just like any private property system is a collective mafia among the property owners. Yeah, I totally agree with Frank. The entire world is the same way, you know, if you boil it down, get rid of the word state, get rid of everything, it's one party, one person, X deals with Y. If they disagree, they get into a war. They have to use politics to work together with one another. They're working together towards a common goal, and if they're not on the same side of that common goal, they dislike each other. It's kind of very similar to human society. So I kind of want to know what you had to say about the world working as an anarchist state. Yeah, I think I think a common theme is ideally everybody would want to just you know, coexist with each other without feeling like they have to use coercion as a means of living. But then the counter argument to that is always going to be, well, you have to or somebody else will. If you, you know, don't have a law that threatens someone, like that protects your whatever with violence, you know, then people will use violence to take it from you. But I think that the argument is always kind of, well, I would love to have a peaceful world, but there's violence, so I'm going to be a perpetrator of violence because it exists already. So, I understand so yes, like, exactly what you're saying. To me, when we talk about anarchy versus government, you're always, you, you can always have a beautiful idea that might work very well when you talk about anarchy, but there's always going to be an opposing argument that says, well, you know, but we have colonialism now, we have taxes now, we have violence now. So this ideal has to work with kind of the way, you know, the, the way things work messily now. But I think, you know, maybe if we can talk about a way that, you know, instead of saying hypothetically, how does anarchy work? Say, let's take the way things are now, and then say, think about your ideal of what all the fruits that anarchy would bring, and then what would the transition look like? You have a real world example. It's called the planet. 200 some odd planetary citizens called sovereign states, generally speaking, don't engage in acts of violence against each other, and they do so by virtue of being self-protectionist agencies. They have the right to the gun. They form voluntary associations in the form of alliances. And in so doing, they mostly, at most times, protect their own sovereign territory and liberty. It can be done. Liberty is done. The problem is, there's only 200 of them. Okay, there are me, millions of us. Well, let me address that. Uh, or do you want to? Well, I, I, just, I just want to quickly say that if, if you consider the states to be individual people, and in the, you can be, not to interrupt, but in the in international law, they are the legal entities. You and I do not have legal standing. The state has legal standing. Sovereign, sovereign states in international law. So there are, in fact, 200 people out there. Right. So let's say that it goes about to power. So if one city gets to power, and the other is opposing, there's a balance of everyone's rights are present. 
protects their own rights. And we have the same example in the grill. People uh, perform their own, can, can perform their own protect the agency it has now, they have a specific historical example. And then if one gets too powerful, then uh, the others oppose it. And then you, know, you have an anarchy that, that works. Yep. Well, here's, uh, here's, here's my take on that. Um, First of all, when you talk about the states protecting their liberty, uh, I disagree with that. States do not have rights, only individuals do. Uh, when you're talking about a community of states, you're talking about a community of organizations that violate the rights of the individuals within their boundaries. Wait a minute. And therefore, you're basically talking about a system of control and of oppression, not one of protection of anything other than the privilege of those who can benefit from the state. And that's wrong. And this is what I'm opposed to. Wait, wait, wait. A collection of organizations. Wait a minute. Cellular organizations. I don't know. No, because we can always join together. We can always join together to say okay I need protection because I know that not everybody's an angel so I'm gonna to join together I'm gonna to hire a company I'm gonna do so wait wait I'm gonna I'm gonna to join together but I can choose who I'm going to join together with to form a protective uh, association it's not like somebody's gonna say okay I'm the police and you're gonna pay for me whether you like it or not and whether you like what I'm doing or not you're paying for it you're stuck with what I say this is where the problem Problem comes in. Um, uh, so to go back to, I don't know your name, but Elijah. Elijah. To go back to your point, uh, you talked about look at the problems governments are causing. I think you mentioned that a minute ago, and that's exactly the point. It's their governments are the creating all kinds of social evil. So my point is, what we need to do is look at it from that negative point of view. Let's take away the causes of the evil, and we will have many benefits. That's the point to be made here. I, but Darren, the thing is here, you want to problematize the identity of the nation state, but you're not problematizing the identity of the individual. Biologically, every one of us is an ensemble of cells. What particular ensemble of cells constitutes an individual or not? Now that might seem pretty obvious. Well, it's, it's, I guess, the boundaries of your skin. Imagine if I were a woman. Imagine if I were pregnant. Now is there one biological entity here or two? And we have debates about that, right? Okay, that <laughs> means that in the real world, we problematize individual identity. It's not a settled matter. Those, you know, I, I don't even have to go down the panel to make it clear here about, it's a debate about whose identity, two or one. And that means that this whole discussion here, that rights in here in the individual, apart from being historical fantasy, because it's not by the way the real world has evolved, it's an ethical concept that you're trying to impose on the discussion. It might be a fine one. I'm not disputing its moral value. I mean, I'm disputing its historical relevance. And then on top of it all, it's embedded within some notion of individuality, which itself, notions of identity that are historically problematic. All right, and let me, let me stop you there. And... Uh, but I think that's part of the point you just made is really our point as far as the individual goes. And uh, you made a point earlier that people are imperfect. And, you know, we elect all these representatives to represent our interests. And they go to government and they kind of work it out and hopefully come up with an ideal that we could all, I'm sorry, that we could all, uh, you know, come together and, and, and agree on. Uh, that individual being perfect, I think, is exactly the reason why we don't want a lot of power in the hands of government. Because we, it's that old quote that, uh, what is it, absolute power? Absolute power? Or absolutely. I mean, we, we all were, came out to the rallies for Ron Paul, and Ron Paul to us is like the ideal candidate because he wants to go represent us and make sure that the government keeps off our backs. But there are not many Rob Pauls in the world, and they're all looking for uh, ways that they can make a buck out of Washington, D.C. by passing laws in their own district, by you know getting more power, getting more connections, more political connections. I think that's exactly the reason why you said that the Constitution was written so that 
the government could, you know, evolve over time and grow. I think that's, I would rather go back to the Articles of Confederation myself, but I think the Constitution was written as a set of rules to constrain the government on the individual. And I think the Tenth Amendment basically says, you know, we've listed all these things that the government can't do, and the Tenth Amendment says, oh, by the way, if we forgot anything, you can't do that either. No, it doesn't say yes, that. It, it, does says, say it says the federal government can't do it. It doesn't right. say anything about state government, right. but then, which could go and trample all over your rights. But then you have the freedom to move out of that state. If Not if they close the borders. Actually, well, the, uh, actually, uh, uh, wait, 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 wait,
We elect the person who understands that slightly better than the rest of us to go and then discuss it with the other people. And you need the top down and the bottom up working together in conjunction to figure well, out. The, the House of Representatives is a clear example that that's not how real politicians behave. They act according to the interests, and their interests are in getting reelected, and they're quite good at doing that. The, the issue here is the, gov the American government was engineered to be a status quo enforcement mechanism. And it's engineered that the whole business of checks and balances, separation of powers, designed, baked into the system to make it very difficult to change anything. And that worked fine for the founders because what they were trying to bake into the cake was a system of northern commerce and southern slavery, and that's the government that they designed that would reinforce those social relations. Over time, those social relations changed, mostly on the street, either through war, civil war, street politics, protests, women's movements, civil okay. rights movements, and the like. You end up now with a changed undergirding, and the, and, and, and the state now has much more responsibility than it was ever intended to have. But it still has the same checks and balances, it still has the same separation of powers, which hamstrung Wait a minute, I'm going to jump in real quick and then you're up. Uh, I'm going to say the two of you, you're actually making my point for me. Um, it seems to me you guys are arguing for anarchism because uh, what, what I want to do is bring in market forces, which markets do change quickly and much more quickly than governments ever will. Bring the market into the production of security, as it's been called. And then rather than have it as an imposed, uh, embedded, uh, you know, uh, fossilized kind of thing that doesn't change. Uh, the, the government, doesn't get security, the government the doesn't. You mentioned the government as a, as an, uh, trying to institutionalize these these evil things, the northern uh, commercial dominance and southern slavery. Um, well, that's an argument against the government. Right there, you made my point for me. But you know what? In a equal like distribution of income and wealth, if you if you commoditize security, it's already unequal enforcement, and Center City gets it better than a lot of other places. Okay, so what, what happens in a world where we all have to voluntarily contract right. security? Let's go with Elijah. You wanted to say something. I was just going to say, um, I used to do social work. Yes. And the kind of work I used to do, you know, I found that most of my you know, attitudes toward the work I was doing became clouded with my pessimism. Because when I used to think about helping people, my concentration was always with, this is wrong with the system, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And I found that um, the more productive I became, the more I was able to look at, okay, so pretend that I could go all day with problems with government, let's say, you know. It doesn't really mean anything if I can't come up with an alternative. So, uh, just anything you talk about, it, it really doesn't make any kind of case to look, make a long list of how government fails, because that's, to me, that's, that's never the argument, because you could make the same case about anarchy. The question is, you know, government is here, and, you know, anarchy is, isn't, and how would you get from one to the other? But, and, and one more thing I want to say. Uh, I noticed that when you talk about anarchy, you talk about uh, doing away with government but then keeping money and keeping the economy and keeping the market. And I don't see how, you know, like he brought up the point about, you know, uh, you know North Philadelphia and Center City, you know, the disparities that you have in the world. Yeah. And really, you know, I think government is kind of the only, it's the biggest force that's protecting people with most of their property and most of their money to, to have it when, if you look at the entire world and kind of the inequities that are there, you know, I think, I think to, um, to adopt anarchy and then keep money, I, I, don't, I don't think that's how it is. Oh, well, let me, let me address that one. Um, 
my advocacy of money is uh, money as a privately created commodity, not as a governmentally issued and imposed one. Uh, we can trade, we can certainly trade in whatever we want. <clears throat> a great example today is something called Bitcoin. Uh, I don't know if most of you are probably not familiar with it. It's actually an electronic currency that is outside of government control. People are starting to use it now. Uh, I guess you'll have to go home and... You know, Is Bitcoin failing? Uh, not that I know of, but... Um, What's the name? Bitcoin. Well, we've got, we've got examples in Africa yeah. where they use cell phone minutes as commodities now, okay. too. So, so systems like that certainly could work. Money but it has to be a valued commodity to the whole community for it to work. I know people yeah. in uh, Philadelphia that use uh, bus coins. So it is it's a commodity. That's not going to scale, right? Well, I think Amazon's going to take bus coins. Well, but now, the, way that, the way that Bitcoin works is you actually have to add into the, you add to the code of the system. It's something along the lines of like, you have to add and develop your own code and it's like a constantly growing yeah. bank in a way. I don't remember, like, I don't know that much about software design, but it's something along the lines of you have to do your own software programming and therefore you get more coins for doing that and you're able to build their system while at the same time getting paid for it, something along those yeah. lines. So there's, there's certainly no reason why there can't be different systems of, uh, of uh, mon different monetary systems. And by the way, uh, the, there's a Bitcoin Summit next Saturday here in Philadelphia, if you're interested. I'll, uh, I'll put up a link to it. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Uh, I would also refer to how in, um, in six, was it 17th century England, there, they considered that there was a shortage of coins, and guess what? The button makers started making coins. You know, there's, this was on a bigger scale than just like using bus tokens uh, for, uh, for for com for money. There's no reason why there can't be an international uh, international currencies being traded all over the world. There's absolutely no reason for it. Already are <laughs> privately pri privately <laughs> issued. <laughs> privately <laughs> issued. Yes. I think that the problem, big issue is that we're looking at this with the vacuum without looking at actuality and how people respond to different things. Think of uh, there's a famous case in Vietnam. I believe it's Vietnam in the 60s where the French government was ruling and they said they, they wanted to get rid of the rat problem that they had in one of the cities. So they said, all right, we're going to put a bounty on it. If you go out and you kill a rat, you all you have to do is bring us the tail and we'll give you money for it so we think that that way the rat population will go down. Rat population went up. So they went out to the countryside and they found that people, the farmers out there, were growing the rats. <laughs> this is a really great example of how the market can fail because it, it all depends on where you put the incentives. Like in Vietnam, this happened in India with cobras. This has happened in Mexico, Bolivia, with car rules in terms of what days you can drive. Right, right. So you put the rules or the incentives on a certain thing, and you get these unintended consequences because that's how the market works. The market goes where the money is. Okay, Katie, I'm sorry, but this is a failure. Of government, it's the governments that were failure. This is actually the success. This is the success. This is the argument. Right, right. This is a success and intention of the government. Right. 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 Uh, but that's a that's a private. But Katie, Katie, because that's a private. Stop, stop, stop. Frank, Frank, stop. You're, stop. Wait a minute. I can't let that go, um, Katie. No. Um, what you're talking about is a failure of government. When the government comes up and says, you know, we're going to pay you for X. This, that's not about a market. Okay. That's about a government. The theory of relativity is really great, but it covers almost everything except which is too big and almost everything except which is too small. It's the same thing with government. It's going to cover almost everything, but no matter what, it has to be able to grow and change to cover the things that it doesn't expect. You can't form something on a linear scale and expect it to move in with non-linearity of time. That's the biggest issue. So, yes, so the government, you just said the government saying I'm going to pay you so much for this is coercion. No, I said it's not a market. It's not a market. It's not a market. It's government. So they pay for rent. A private saying I'll pay you 10 cents an hour. You're desperate. I'll pay you 10 cents an hour. That's okay. Would you rather not have the 10 cents an hour? 
Yeah. No, wait. Uh, I think that's that's no, a little the better bit. solution is to shoot the other. I think that misstates the case. Um, the reason a, go a company can get away with paying somebody 10 cents an hour is usually the government steps in, limits competition, stifles economic growth, and creates poverty. If you want people to make more than 10 cents an hour, I say what you need to do is free the economy so that it can grow. And that's and that's not that's not government. That is liberty. The economy is growing to the point where there's so much economic productivity that labor becomes a scarce resource and they can drive up their wages. I mean, to that point, I mean, the minimum wage law, people are saying that they need to minimum wage laws because it's a living wage. Most people, most people make over the minimum wage, so it's that to, you're saying that people would, owners would pay the labor at the least amount possible, so why isn't everybody being paid the minimum wage? John is right, except for the one thing. In the long run, we're all dead. And so, if I put babies out in the marketplace and they get their 10 cents an hour, we would never tolerate that. And the reason why we wouldn't is because we don't, we don't want to treat them like adults. We want to treat them with some level of empathy and sentimentality. Apparently something that we don't want to do amongst individuals that are adults. So therefore, make 10 cents an hour, buck up. You'll eventually get there. Maybe your kids will. Who knows? No, well, I think that's you're. Not, that's I not think a moral you're mis sentiment that many of us no. find palatable. You're misstating. You're misstating the, the case. Uh, first of all, I don't think babies are treated well because there are laws against it. For the most part, I think if parents want to treat their babies well, I don't see how you could put what about child labor laws. I don't see how that's, uh, that that's was. A <laughs> child labor was pervasive in this country. Well, that's a consequence of human that's experience and understanding. Now wait a minute. Wait a minute. Child child, child labor laws are interesting because. Child Child labor went away not because of law, but because of increases in productivity. I mean, first, if you look at pre-industrial eras, the kids died. They just died. At least when they were able to work, they survived. And then as, product as productivity increased in society became more productive that they could afford to like have kids not work and maybe do things like go to school, that's when child labor went away. The law just played catch up on that one. I don't think so. I think what happened was you took kids out of the labor market, artificially depressed the supply of labor and shot up its wages. But they were working on the, the reason people said they had so many kids up until the industrial age is because they needed farm workers. So these kids were working on the farms anyway. And what happened was that when the industrial age came along, the families still needed the income and the productivity from the child. So they just sent them out to the company rather than the farm. But when economic productivity and labor became more and more of a scarce resource and people were able to run off the wages, get an easier uh, standard of living, the children didn't have to work anymore. I mean, the, the same thing that happened in Bangladesh. They imposed child labor laws there. But the thing is, if the child doesn't, the child represents about 20% of the family's income. So if the child doesn't work, they don't eat. So what happens when you have to keep the child labor laws imposed on there, what happened is a lot of the children had to go into prostitution because they weren't making any money and the, and the families were starving. Yeah, and the, 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 when we say had to, had to, had to, that's within a context within which society distributes resources in such a way so that the mass and robbers find themselves using their children as instrumentalities of economics. Well, then that's morally wrong. But that's the government that's doing all, it, too. So. That's all in that's called private property. Right. 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 There was child labor in America growing. They didn't think that there was any other option. You know, the same, the same way that you're saying the government was formed around slavery and bringing it prosperity to southern slave owners is because they didn't think that there was any other possible way. How could they know that there was another possible way without slowly developing and growing over time? Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think they would have that foresight to be quite honest. It's the exact problem with creating a government yeah. based on one moment in time, based on a linear perspective of how things work. It's setting rules which are meant to change over time. Yeah, but the, I mean, the portrayal is that you know kids were you know going to school and playing in parks, flying kites on the beach before the big industrialists came along and snatched them up and threw them into the factories. I mean, there was a reason that they were there, and the reason is exactly what I just discussed. I mean, they had to be there, or else the farm, or else the families, you know, didn't eat. Yeah, and, and as a historical matter, you're exactly correct. <laughs> I'm not disputing the history of the matter. The point is, is that we today 
have a different moral sentimentality about in, about small in, human beings. Because yeah, we can afford to. We don't have that same sense. Oh, oh, oh. So we can't afford to. We can afford to. Can we afford to have sentimentality towards the people or the involuntarily unemployed? All right, let's well, let then, uh, Elijah. Well, that gets solved through government. Well, it gets solved through charity. Well, let's let Elijah speak, speak here. here. Well, I think, I think the point that you just brought up is really interesting because take the society you know, as, as it is now and take a man who is uneducated, uh, comes from a poor family, but is very strong, physically strong, and then take someone who comes from a privileged background, um, you know, went to college, and now they're like a, a market executive or, a, or, you know, or something like that. Now, government rewards one person uh, you know, because just, just the way things work, they'll make more money and their, contribu their contribution to society is more valuable. But if you look at it on a moral perspective, and who contributes more, you know, the, in the case of anarchy, you know, perhaps, I think that just changes the scope of instead of, you know, the standard that everybody agrees to, it's more like an individual determines their own merit based on what they can provide for you directly. So a strong man, just a man who's strong, might have more value than someone whose skills don't only uh, are useful when putting context in this very specific niche that a government has created for. So a lot of advertisers, a lot of bankers, a lot of people who might assume that they are skilled and that their skills merit their value, you know, is actually an arbitrary measurement that's defended by government. So no. I think, wow. you know, when... Absolutely. No, I, I'm standard. sorry. <laughs> well, okay, let's wait. I think both of those examples can be fixed by, can be fixed by the market. The one, the one who has a college education and has a niche can be hired as a government executive. That the person who's strong can be drafted by a citizen. That's an outfit. And get just as much and get It's both a side of the market, not by, not by a government position. The problem is it you're talking be. about the person with more education is able, strength, is able to think more abstractly than the person who's not been able to actually be educated. And it's, and it's limited to the bounds that he understands. You're talking about like people who have completely different tools and concepts about how things can work and how things will work. Uh, let's let uh, get a back. Um, my comment was going to be, just like you said, um, I know this couple that <clears throat> they lived in Israel. And he was, a, they lived in Israel, and he was a physician, and she was a school teacher. And they decided to move to America. One of them, they had like parents that were in, lived in America. And because of the safety of their children, they didn't like those bombs going off. <clears throat> and they were so surprised when they got to America that. He was a doctor and he made so much money. Where in Israel, their salaries were like level. And that she made so much less money and he made so much more money. I mean, it was just like, I can't believe they're giving me this money for what I do. You know, I mean, it's just a surprise. Um, but that, I do think that that is something that does happen, you know. Well, let me jump in then. Uh, I think what we're bringing up here is the issue of uh, inequality, obviously. Uh, I, I wanted to make a statement about that. First of all, inequality is unavoidable. And uh, to some degree, it is actually desirable. The question is, how is that inequality coming about? If it's coming about because of government interventions by force in the economy, which favors some at the expense of others, then it's wrong and it's immoral. And that is what we see in today's society more than anything is that kind of inequality. An inequality that comes about because somebody can invent a better widget and market it and help you know everybody because now their, their standard of living is higher and he creates employment and, and on and on, that inequality is great. I have no problem with the, the rich entrepreneur who makes his money on the market selling a product people need and, and that's great. They can be millionaires and the person who is happy um, I don't know, uh, working at a university. <laughs> isn't a millionaire, you know? And then that's fine, you know? To me, that's normal. And, and so what happens to the children of that entrepreneurial millionaire? 
Uh, they vacation in Aruba? I, I, well, that, 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 so now we get to the issue uh, that Elijah raised before, which is that in the real world there un, are unequal starting lines. And yes. one can overcome an unequal starting line, but it requires exceptional talent. Whereas those on the leading end of that starting line could be utter morons and still enjoy a reasonably decent life. And I'm all in favor of market forces. I've come full circle on this one. But it's market forces, in order to realize the benefits of the market, a la what you read in a microeconomics textbook, you better get something close to perfect competition. And what they don't really tell you but what is essentially implied by those conditions is a roughly equal distribution of resources in the marketplace. And this gets back to the old Jeffersonian notion that every, I think it was 21 years, there should be a rewriting of the Constitution, there should be a reordering of the contractual agreements, and that includes the economic contractual agreements. So that I am not in a position to pass on uh, to my children or uh, a set of privileges, essentially, that they had no part in creating. Well, here, what I would say to that, real quick, is that there is an old saying about uh, shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in uh, three generations. Uh, the reason that privilege is passed on from one generation to the other more than anything is the government granting those privileges through interventions in the marketplace. It's not a matter of a free market working that way. In a free market, you can be born rich and you can die poor much more easily than in a situation of government granting privileges to people. And that is why I say, no, let's get rid of this this government that is so, so unfair. It doesn't happen that way. Uh, I, well, where, where, well, we see it all around us of the passing on of privilege. I mean, you're you telling me the Rockefellers are not a good example of that? A great example of the passing on of privilege that reinforces inequality over time. I know you're not going to like it, but that's life. The global system, which carves up, we are all basically the inheritors of a long set of generations of Americans who have been authorized by the international state system to occupy a certain corner of the planet. Do with it as we see fit. We've been very good at doing it, but let me tell you right now, most of us here have nothing to do with it. We are the inheritors of previous generations who have privatized rights over a chunk of planet. Now, sometimes some countries, they, 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 they buck up and they are move ups. The Chinese or the Indians may be heading in that direction. And sometimes the ones on top eventually fall. But even the ones that fall don't fall too far. Britain is still one of the top nations on the planet from a military and economic perspective. And why is that? Because the overall system reinforces the privileges of those of us in what they used to call the North. Isn't that government? Isn't that no. my argument? That's no. my argument, no. isn't it? No. No. Frank, I hear what you're saying, but what you're saying, what's your idea on how a government should look? I'm actually heading towards Smithian, Lockean, small, limited government, enforced redistribution of wealth uh, periodically so that there can be no inheritance and basically a certain amount of Stalinist insistence that our, ed our children become educated to be citizens. I'm sorry, did you say Stalinist? Mm -hmm. No, there are. Well, Fair, families are all over No, no, did you say Stalinist? Well, well, well you Stalinist? Please, don't, you know where I'm going with this. I didn't, I families, wanted to say Families, when, when well run, when well run, are benevolent dictatorships. Yeah. For imposing values on children. So, but then how do we get the people to be better That's at it? So that they they become how do they become citizens. better dictators? But then good is totally relative, which brings back to the point that I made a while ago, of that the only way for us to make those people better dictators is to educate them better to think more abstractly. Which means Absolutely. that we currently need a government who can build our own understanding of what we are and where we're going. We're currently not at a place where any person on the planet can understand how a government should function and the best ways to bring people together. But on the other hand, if we have better education, we can then have better in-family dictatorships. I agree. So what we need is a constitutional convention, but not the way it's envisioned by many people here who would let the hordes 
of I hate everybody who doesn't look like me make the rules. I want to have the Jeffersons and the Madisons and people who have some elevated sense of the common good remaking the rules. Well, okay, I would ask you then, uh, so the eugenicists take over the government and they're getting rid of the people that they don't like because they don't look like them. This is a historical example. I don't understand this idea of benevolent dictatorship. There is no such thing. This is looking at government through rose-colored glasses uh, and living in some fantasy world American that government should. Uh, it, uh, no, it was a, it was, a, it was a coup. I will agree with you, but it was not benevolent. The whole purpose was to create a strong federal government that could help the the interests, the special interests, as we call them today. Agreed, but they did so in a way that at least paid some attention to the welfare of everyday people. Today, what we have are people who are just self-aggrandizers. This whole argument about preserving tax, taxes or marginal rates for a tiny majority and minority of people who don't need the income, who derive very little marginal benefit from the next dollar they earn, is a, is a testimony, a case in point. All right, I wanted to, Frank, I wanted to ask you a question. You, you said something that really got my attention, so I want to ask you this question. You mentioned uh, your thinking is Lockean in, to a degree. Uh, the Lockean idea of you mix your labor with the, uh, the natural resources and this creates a property right. I don't see how you can rec reconcile that with an idea of forced redistribution. It seems like the one tramples the other because, and it doesn't make it. It's just a contradiction. Uh, bourgeois thinking on how this thing is reproducible over time is wrong. You take a static conception, take a society at a given point in time, small farmers, small shopkeepers, reasonably educated, uh, voluntaristic, engaging in, in free association and contract. Uh, the image there, the presumption is that that type of society in and of itself is reproducible over time. And in fact, it is not. And it's very simple to see why it's not. It's actually, you can look at the, you know, I know I'm bouncing all over the place, but if you look at the International Football League, it's organized as a, as a socialist enterprise of forced redistribution of revenues across the teams. Why does it do that? Because over time, winners develop built-in uh, advantages over the relative losers, because you're right, in the real world, there is inequality in capability. So even if everybody came to the table with the same number of dollars, we're not going to end up at the same place at the end of the race. Those of us who end up ahead now start the next round of the race ahead, and so right. on, so forth. So, like you said, it, so it's not a reproducible society over the long term, absent forced redistribution back to the, not the losers per se, well, but, but the children of the losers who had no, who are neither responsible for the winnings of their parents or the losses of their parents. But Frank, you, you said, you mentioned that you were going in a Lockean direction and you're thinking, and Locke was clear about the origin of property I, rights. I, I meant in terms of how one might organize a government. I stand by what I have said. All rules are systems of coercion. A Lockean system of government is a system of coercion. My claim is that a Lockean system, a Smithian system, is not reproducible over time without the added coercion of forced redistribution at periodic points in, in that society, in that society's evolution. Well then, why shouldn't I go out on the street here and uh, threaten somebody with weapons and redistribute their wealth to my pocket? If it's not immoral to do that, why shouldn't all of us be right here? Again, you're confusing morality with rules, okay? I'm talking about a system of rules. No system of rules presumably would disable the ability of private individuals from privately enforcing systems of redistribution. It would be done collectively. Well, but how, how can the collective have more rights than the individual? Because as I said before, the rights of the individual come from the totality as a historic, political, empirical fact. Well, that's a little light to speak here. When you said, uh, you know, what would keep you from going out on the street and, you know, putting an act of violence? To what I said was, why shouldn't I? Why shouldn't, why shouldn't I? More of a moral than a police issue. Well, exactly. I, I don't think it has to be a question of morality and just intelligence. So, think about recently when there was this big push for green energy. 
and people try to find a way to commit these cutthroat companies why they should you know, be more environmentally friendly. If they had did it, well, because it's the right thing to do, they never would have gotten anywhere. They had to say, well, look, the people who support you, you know, will appreciate, you know, doing business with you a lot more if they felt like you were contributing to something they believe. So even the most self-interested entity, you know, will jump on board to something that is intelligent. Because if you always make it a question of morality, I, I don't think you can, you know, include people who are self-interested. You know, and I think everybody to some degree is self-interested. So to make it a question of right or wrong, I think is less practical than saying, look, it may be the intelligent thing to do to be non-violent and cooperative. Because it's more than I think. I think there's one major difference between some between going out on the street and committing that robbery and being behind some sort of corporation is that you're talking about anonymity versus non-anonymity, and it is proven how much differently we act when we think that we are anonymous, and even when we are anonymous. Uh, you're not going to go out in the street. If you've ever seen anybody who has been out on the street robbing, it's not out of like self-interest. It's out of fear. There is fear in the eyes of somebody who is robbing. You. It's not. Well, I disagree. I think it's mostly out of self-interest and not fear. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to okay. throw in. I was robbed at gunpoint once on a street, and the guy was definitely not very afraid of me. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you know. I'm, I'm, fear like, you know he, uh, I'm terrified. I don't know. Anyways, I think you wanted to. Um, just to back what you said uh, about the green energy. Um, if the major corporations in the energy market had been, if they went to them and said, well, it's the right thing to do, they wouldn't have done it. Well, it's probably right, but I mean, first of all, there's a reason why there are only a select few energy monsters in this world, and that's because the government has helped them create their energy energy. Now, I'd say to you that a self-interested startup company that had, like, a innovative idea about how to uh, initiate or create green energy on uh, a cheap, should come in and you know tell Exxon to take a hike and take over the energy business because they have this thing that everybody's gonna want. Everybody they can't do that now because they've they've erected these barriers of entry thanks to organizations like the EPA, the Department of Energy, uh, and, and the like, institutions of the like. So I mean, the free market would solve that problem. Uh, well if Exxon doesn't feel like creating great energy because you know they're Selfish bastards or whatever, they, the other, the other smaller guy can come in and take over and tell them to take a hike because they got something better than the consumer wants. Well, but right now they're, they're in the protective so feature. They have no incentive Why should they? They got the, uh, the market cornered on oil thanks to their buddies in Washington. So why should they? Why have industries polluted? Because the government lets them. Yeah. Because we don't know any other way. Like, no. It's not like the government hasn't privatized the atmosphere and the water. Is that basically what it is? Yeah. Can I have those private rights? Not, because so you're, like, when, you're, when you're not actively no, there no, seeing what's rights. happening, you're, when you're not seeing the effects of what you're doing, you have no way of conceptually understanding if what you're doing is bad or good. You only understand what is positive for yourself. It's not like you're thinking... Well, here, wait a minute, wait a minute. Back to this point. Wait a minute, wait a minute. I want to... How, how do you assign property rights in natural resources that are right now unprivatized and basically the damage of which results in market failure air pollution water pollution overfishing of, of okay of, let me of, let me of, let me answer the international water let me answer let me answer i want to that ties in here uh why is the, the, the question of why is pollution happening is exactly the problem of protection of property when you can pollute you can put your pollution from from your property over to somebody else's the protection of property is fighting pollution too so how do you do wait, wait a minute wait a minute wait a minute um <clears throat> the um so that's that's what I'm thinking. So property protects uh, protects us from pollution. One reason we have pollution, and this goes back to the around the 1840s and before, as the U U.S. was starting to industrialize, people were using the nuisance laws to sue the industrialists to not pollute the air over their property. And in the beginning, it worked. But then, when the industrialists basically took control of the government, then they started to say, "No, we're not going to do that. We're going to let them pollute." That's the history. Pollution happens because government lets it happen. So, so are you let's, saying that, that, that my property, let's say we're talking about a piece of land, 
that my that your definition of, of my property, if I had to say, I don't know, 100 square feet, that it was in just the 100 square feet of, of, of soil uh, in the junk below, it's also the atmosphere straight up into uh, outer space. And so if anybody pollutes that corner of the atmosphere without my permission, I can now take them to court for basically trespass. How are they supposed to know they're polluting the air if we've never experienced anything like that before? Well, wait a minute. The issue that we're looking at is so, so, so what you were saying. So the air in that way, and somebody came onto my property, and I said, well, you know what? You can't breathe my air without paying me for it. I mean, these are unworkable solutions. No, this is what's... That's what's... why we have public spheres.